Uh, hello, good to meet you. I've been really looking forward to this. It's always a great crowd at Happy Events, so thank you for having me. Um, and thank you for that intro, Maureen. Ten years ago, my company, Propellernet, was a small search marketing agency, quite unremarkable, based down in Brighton. Fifteen of us with no real game plan, apart from holding on to enough clients to make the next payroll run, and try not to drown in unnecessary process. Our focus on purpose was latent, it wasn't clearly defined. We pitched a lot, and we won a lot. We had no real strategy around who we wanted to work with. Our staff retention was really high, mainly because people were having far too much fun to be looking elsewhere. But that soul-crushing crushing, propeller who, when we spoke to recruitment consult consultants, was always there, because we hadn't really made our mark on the industry. And to be honest, we could have disappeared, and no one would have cared. Maybe me. So this is our story of how we grew up, how we went from Brighton to Global, how we went from our own particular breed of mayhem to one of the best places to work in the UK, and from unremarkable to super engaged. On that journey, we've been named Search Agency of the Year, European Agency of the Year, won the Drum Grand Prix for creativity in our industry, and many client accolades. We've also launched two technology products into the world, and they've gone global. And we've been named one of the best places to work in the UK for now six years in a row, which is brilliant. So we must have done something good. So firstly, what is search marketing? So I'm just going to ask you to have a think about something. When was the last time you Googled something? And can you put your hand up if you Googled something in the last month? Keep your hand up if you did it in the last week, last 24 hours. Yeah, there's people like us all over the planet Googling, looking for things they need, they want, they want advice about. Over 40,000 searches every second. That's three and a half billion each year. So could you put your hand up if you've Googled something you wouldn't ask anybody else? Your best friend, your doctor, your other half. Yes, I've done it too. Good. Um, we do that because it's fast. It's supposed to be the font of all knowledge. You know, Google wants to organise all of the world's information. It's anonymous and it's a safe space. But what we're doing when we Google something is we're providing data, not in a Cambridge Analytica kind of way. This is all anonymized data. But you can see it yourselves. You know, when you type into Google, you see the auto suggest. Whereas well, a search marketing agency, we can drill a bit deeper into that. And we're sitting on a mountain of insights as to what people want. We have a deep insight in, into what people are looking for. Search behavior is an in the moment bias free gift to marketers. It's a marketer's dream, and I'm, I'm big on dreams, which you'll, you'll see in a minute. So, what does that actually mean? What do we do with all that data and those insights? Well, our client Nielsen came to us and said, Could you help us sell our mountain collection of winter ski holidays? Of course, we can. Now, what's interesting about the mountain collection is you get a mountain expert to work with you to see if you can get off piste to make you a better skier. So, it's for people who aren't beginners but are, are more expert in their skiing. Really competitive market, the winter market for ski holidays. So how do you find these people who aren't beginners but actually are better and more expert in what they're doing? Well, it's really interesting when you look online at what people are searching for. If you're looking for skiing or boarding, you tend to get results around hints and tips and tricks of where to go and who to, what to wear and that kind of stuff. But when you make it personal and you ask about skiers or boarders, something really interesting happens. And it's all about tribes. And you can see from here, quite a bit of tension there, which is rich territory for us as marketers to jump on the back of and get stuck in with the debate. So we enlisted the help of two Olympians. This is Jamie Nichols and Katie Summerhays to help us with that debate and steal market share of the really competitive ski market for Nielsen as a brand challenger. And this is what it looked like.
we'll let you guys decide. So that's the kind of thing we do with search data, just to get a handle on what problem that is. But that's the what. It's the how and the why that I think is more interesting and where the performance elements lie in how our business grew up. And that was really crystallised for me when we started to really articulate our purpose, stop it from being latent and just kind of behind the scenes, but really articulate it into a vision that our team could get behind. And that happened when I met this chap. Um, this, is, this guy is Ben Hunt-Davies. He's an Olympic rower, rode for Team GB in the Sydney 2000 Olympics, same time as Sir Steve Redgrave and Matthew Pinsent. And he and his eight-man crew were deemed to be the underdogs, but they didn't want to be the underdogs. They wanted to get on the podium. Didn't just want to get on the podium, they wanted to win gold. And um, Ben has talked about this a lot. He's written a book about it, how they actually achieved that. And in the four years running up to the Olympics in Sydney in the year 2000, they had their lives defined by one mantra, and people who may know what it is, but it's a really simple mantra, and it works brilliantly in the world of rowing. And it's, will it make the boat go faster? Will being in the training tank for two more hours today make the boat go faster? Yes, then we'll do it. We're going down the pub for a pint and a pint, make the boat go faster? No, possibly we shouldn't do it then. They didn't even go to the opening ceremony of the Sydney Olympics because their race was the next day, and they thought, no, it won't make the boat go faster, so they didn't go. And as Ben was handing around his um, medal, has anyone, has anyone held an Olympic? Has anyone won an Olympic medal? <laughs> okay. Has anyone held an Olympic medal? It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's, it's, it's real, it was a really defining moment for me. I was like, wow, that's really powerful. What mantra could we have that defines our business, our business making decisions, things that everyone could align behind and understand that drives forward for the purpose of propelling it? And ours is really simple and it's a question and we use it every day. It's will it make life better? Now, it can seem a bit of a nebulous statement, but actually it really defines everything we do. When we take on a client and they give us a brief, when we first started looking at the Nielsen work, so what can make life better for these people who are good at skiing who want to find out more? How can we entertain them? How can we get them involved in the brand? What can we do that's going to be good for them? When we take on a new client, we think, what can we do to make that life better for that client? Are we excited about their brand? Can we work with them? Are we like-minded? Can we do really good work? When we take on new people, how can we make life better for that person joining the agency? Are they going to really add value to what we're doing? Can we add value to what they do? Is what um, uh, Cathy was saying earlier, hire smart people and they just let them go, go and see what they want to do. How can, we make, how can they make life better internally? And it's locked up there in our logo. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do um, is think about your vision and talk to the person next to you, ideally somebody you haven't spoken to before, maybe get up and move tables, and think about your vision, but also how your team articulate it, and if they can articulate it really well, and do they use it on a daily basis. Over to you. I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on it, because it could take more time, and I just want to whiz through. So, the world has changed dramatically since Propellinet came into existence. There was no Facebook, there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter. The iPad was seven years away, the iPhone four years away. And the world of work has changed dramatically since we started. WikiLeaks, the sharing economy, gig economy, fake news, our jobs being taken by robots, more people wanting to work flexibly and good on them. But despite this radical shake-up, the world of work seems to be stuck in old ways of working, where we're still trying to squeeze far too much out of people. People become a number on a spreadsheet as opposed to a human. And it's no wonder so many employees are disengaged. You probably will know this statistic. A recent Gallup poll updated the levels of engagement worldwide, and only 30% of us are engaged in what we're doing, which means 70% of us are just turning up, possibly not bringing our wholesales to work, probably turning up, hoping not to get fired. What a waste of collective human intelligence is that? Think about your company. It's not saying you're languishing down at the 30% mark, but how much more productive could you be and how much more fun could you be having if the other 70% were engaged? There's some big problems to solve on this planet. This is the United Nations 17-point plan of issues we need to solve. 17? Imagine if we had that collective intelligence of the other 70% of people who were engaged in their jobs, what we could achieve and what we could do. I spent the last 20 years on a bit of a mission in various places I've worked and now leading my own business, in putting people before profit. Having worked in advertising for a long time and with various captains of industry, I've been quite disappointed each time in that sole line focus on margin rather than people being human, which is bizarre in a creative industry. So what we want to do is really get people to embrace the fact if you put people first, performance increases and your profits naturally do too. At Propellinet, we've changed that statistic and 90% of the team are engaged or, or super engaged. And why is that important? Well, it shows up in the numbers every single time. Our staff turnover rate is 7%. The industry average is around 30% based on the latest IPA report. Our 
Sick days are about one a year. The average is five to 12, depending on which report you look at. And 98% of the team would recommend working in the agency, which I'm, I'm really proud of. So having that vision, I believe, has helped to shape the culture and up our engagement levels. And it's also enabled us to start challenging the norms of what's possible at work. But before I go there, has anyone listened to this podcast? It's brilliant. It's by Bruce Daisley, who's the EMEA VP at Twitter. And he's on a mission to make life better at work. I'm quite a fan of his. And he's got some incredible statistics around what is and isn't working. Average working hours have increased 27% since we put email on our phone. We've added two hours to our working day just to try and keep up and keep checking with what's going on in the world. 50% of people, that's half of all people, report, report being tired or exhausted at work because we're all in this cortisol-drenched, adrenalised attempt to keep checking email, keep keeping up with the robots. What's the opposite of trying to keep keeping up with the robots, the apps, the emails, the bots? How about daring to dream? Have a think about places you'd like to go, people you dream of meeting, something you dream of achieving. And how amazing would it be if your employer could help make that dream come true? Or if you, as an employer, could make the dreams of your team come true? This is a dream ball machine, go with me on this one. And these are dream balls, and inside these dream ball capsules are the names of each person in the agency who's passed their probation. And if we win an award, or we hit a target, or just because it's sunny, because there's no rules around dreams, we release a dream ball and aim to make that person's dream come true. Now, how do we know what the dreams are? I love my job. I have dream consultations with people when they pass their probation. And I ask them two questions. What are you going to do personally to make this agency and this business more successful? And if that happens, what dream would you like us to help make come true? I've got about 300 of my team's dreams going around in my head. There's only 60 of us, but people have more than one dream. It's amazing when you start thinking about it. This is Jim and Steve. When we won the first Great Places to Work award, we released team two dream balls, and these guys went off to the World Cup in Rio, something they've both dreamt about since they were that high. This is Alan. His dream came out last summer, and he said he wanted to motorbike across Africa. It looks more like a nightmare than a dream to me. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, Alan's pretty happy and he's pretty pumped and he's developed one of the technology products that's gone global. And this is Eshe. Eshe is in our PR team and she's a prolific food blogger. And she had a dream of creating a travelling kitchen that goes round and cooks with celebrity chefs. Her dream all came out recently and we've helped her deliver Eshe's kitchen and she's recently been working with the Hairy Bikers. So there's some great stuff can happen from around dreams. So I'd just like you to have a think now and turn to somebody else on your table. If your dream ball was in the dream ball machine, what would your dream be? So some of the dreams I've shared with you already are, are, are lovely, but what we've realised is it's not about waiting for your dream ball to drop. Some of our team's dreams, much like the ones we've heard here, are so compelling, they become part of our business plan. This is Dan. Dan was one of our technical SEO consultants, and he said he wanted to spend more time making and building things. So we gave him the time. We trust Dan. He's brilliant at what he does. And Dan built this. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It's a tool called Answer the Public. It's like a supercharged Google you just did it over the weekend. You didn't really need much time. And what you do is you type in here, in this search box, what you're interested in, in, in promoting. So say we stick with snowboarding. Um, you type in here and you can see from the results everything that people are looking for to find out about snowboarding. So for the PR industry and the content marketing industry, this is like gold dust. It's, it's kind of our gift to that industry because we're part of it. And it's definitely making life better because people tell us all the time. So if you put snowboarding into that search box, you get this kind of result. And there'll be about 15 of these different wheels, which I know is quite hard for you to see. But there's an incredible amount of search data insight in there, such as which is easier, snowboarding or skiing. So people are looking for hints and tips. Snowboarding, which foot forward? Depends if you're left or right-handed. Who invented snowboarding? People are looking for research. And which, what snowboard to buy? So there's purchase intent there. And that's just a really high-level perspective on this kind of information. But it's absolute gold dust. Over 140,000 people are using this a month. That's way more than it comes to the PropellerNet website and a lot of our clients, actually. And um, it's been named a top 10 product hunt innovation and awarded by the CIPR as the best innovation tool. Now, if we hadn't have asked, we would never have known, and this would never have seen the light of day, and we wouldn't have been able to make life better in the PR and content marketing industry. This is Sophie. She's our audience strategy director, and she loves animals. A uh, big animal, she wants to go on safari, and Sunnyo climbs now. The biggest animal we've had in the agency is an office dog, so they weren't really sort of fulfilling her dream. So when Wild Dog Safaris approached us and said, can you help us with our marketing? They were based in Namibia. They were just a little bit too small and the, the budgets just weren't really available, but 
dream made our guys off. Sophie would love to go on safari. So we put Sophie and Wild Dog Safaris together. Sophie went out there on her sabbatical for six weeks and came back with a business plan. We're now working with Wild Dog Safaris, doing their marketing for them, and they pay us in free safaris. You can imagine how that's gone down back at the ranch. <laughs> it's a pretty popular one. Um, again, if we'd never have asked, we never would have known. And it's more of a social contract than a commercial one. But that's what I mean about putting pe people before profit, because actually this is really motivating, and our team are learning a hell of a lot. This is Andy. Andy, as you can see from his picture, is mad about bikes. This guy cycles from London to Amsterdam for fun. Um, he and Alan should team up. They, um, he was really interested in bikes, and we didn't have a cycling client or a sport client at the time. He said, look, I'd really love to work more on bikes. It's just my world. It's, it's brilliant. And when Evan Cycles approached us, Andy was the man for the job and to lead the pitch, which he did brilliantly. We won the business. And I'm really proud of the work we've done for Evan Cycles because they came to us asking us to help them promote their e-bike offering, electric bike offering. And when you look online, there's a lot of confusion around what electric bikes are. People are asking lots of questions about what's an e-bike, how does it work, do you charge it up, has it got a motor, all that kind of stuff. So we kind of went down the nostalgia route. And I don't know if anyone in the room is old enough to know the Ridley Scott advert for Hovis from years 1973, where a little boy cycles up Gold Hill. Well, we found that little boy. He's now a fireman, or ex-fireman, called Carl Barlow. And we got him to cycle up that hill again. <laughs> but on an e-bike this time, and this is what happened. He took a bit of finding. He wasn't anywhere online. Facebook account, he was, well, certainly wasn't on Twitter. Um, we found him via his sister because we found um, her talking about the Hovis ad, which is just bizarre. But he was brilliant. He, he went up the hill about 15 times, was absolutely exhausted by the end of it, but he did it pretty good there. Um, so that gives you a flavour of some of the dreams that we're, we're trying to make part of our business plan and effort to make life better, not only in the agency, but in, in our clients' world as well. And the more people we can get out of their cars and onto bikes, it's better for health overall. And the follow-up campaign, campaign to um, Gold Hill for Evans was a campaign called Heartwork, which was very focused on getting commuters out of their cars and onto bikes. I'm going to get this statistic wrong, I think, but if you, if you commute on a bike as versus a car, your risk of heart disease goes down 42% which is quite an incredible statistic. Obviously, it depends how far you go, but that's an average. So the campaign we did, we teamed up with um, Orbital to do a track around the heartbeats of commuters, and it's gone crazy within the world of cycling because it's just a kind of really cool thing to do. So again, making life better is extending into our client work. So I say, that gives you a flavour of some of the dreams and the vision and how we live it, but it's not perfect. There's some days I want to go down the end of the pier in Brighton and scream, but it's, it's very much a commitment we've got to dreams, and it's something that I'd love more people to be thinking about. But you know, it's also the day-to-day -day experience of what happens at Propellernet that means people are engaged and want to do great work. I um, captured this in a book, another book plug, um, Super Engaged, which talks about all the things we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And within that book, oh sorry, the reason for that is we want the ripple effect of Make Life Better to go beyond the agency and into the wider world, which is at the moment pretty unengaged. If we can help up engagement levels, that would be brilliant in terms of living our vision. In the book, there's a manifesto, which I think, yes, there's little flyers being pounded out on the table there. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these points now, but I've just picked out a few of them that I think might be pertinent and interesting for this afternoon. So, first one, make engagement a priority. Can you put your hand up if you know what your profit margins changed by, up or down, last year? 
hope most of you would know that. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay. Keep your hand up if you know what your engagement level is changed by. Oh, more engagement hands. That's, that's never happened before. That's amazing. Well, it's a testament to the people in the room, isn't it? What I always say is, you know, if profit is what you're looking to drive, you need to make your engagement levels as important as your margins because people are engaged, they'll perform better, and you'll have better commercial gains off the back of it. Secondly, no way exists. We talked about this earlier. No way exists, and having a sense of purpose means you can articulate it clearly. People know why you're making decisions, and they can understand in the business what's going on. And knowing why you exist, the why is really important because it gives you a soul. It gives your business a soul, and it, it gives people something to talk about. Now, this was really, really compounded for us when a colleague went to the Amsterdam Music Festival and saw Nile Rogers speak. And I'm a massive fan of Nile Rogers, and she, and everybody else in the room, I'm going to ask you to put your hand up. But um, Nile Rogers talked about the fact that his music is very soulful because music without soul is just noise. And our take on that is business without purpose, it's just admin. And who wants a life of noisy, soulless admin? Thirdly, bring your values out to play. If your purpose is what you're working towards, your values are how you're going to get there. And, you know, we all, well, everyone has well-honed bullshit detectors these days. If they, these things have got to be lived to be believed, these are our values. Innovation and creativity are what clients tend to buy us for. Adventure, fun and well-being is what they tend to feel. Now, when people come into the business, when new starters arrive, we do values-based recruitment, I'm sure most of you do, and I ask, you know, tell me about the innovations you're into. Where's your sense of creativity? Show me your spirit of adventure. Are you fun to be with? And do you take care of yourselves? We've got a real burnout issue in the creative and media industry. It's, it's almost as bad as doctors and lawyers, probably because we sell our time. And I don't want anyone in my team to suffer burnout because you can't be productive in that way and it's really damaging to health overall. So one of the things we do to live and breathe values, particularly well-being, is we have well-being check-ins. Now, these don't cost anything. It's just a conversation. But we ask about four things. Are you taking your holiday? We all need time out. We all know that. If we don't take time out to recharge, we're going to hit burnout. So at quarterly points throughout the year, we make sure people are taking their holiday. You know, we're not robots yet. We need to make sure that we can recharge. Are you taking your propel days? I'd love people to nick this idea. We give people a day a week, uh, sorry, a day a month, to go and propel themselves forwards. So that's 12 days a year. Not particularly interested in what they're doing on that day, although I'm happy to talk about it. What I'm more interested in is what happens when they come back into the business and how they can supercharge what we're doing. Thirdly, are you working with our resident coach? Now we're going to be talking about coaching later. But like any high performance team, I believe that everyone has the ability to get better. So we've got a resident coach in the business. It's totally voluntary to sign up. But if people aren't working with our coach and aren't taking their propel days, I seriously start to wonder and have a conversation with them about, are you taking your own development seriously? You know, engagement isn't all about being nice to people, though that's a good thing. Engagement is about challenge as well and making people you know, see that they can be the best, best version of themselves. And lastly, um, we have a health cash plan. Again, I don't want to know what people are using it for, but I want to know they know how to use it and they can keep themselves as well as possible. Get your people happy. I think I might be preaching to the converted here. But um, <laughs> it's not rocket science, but happy people do better work than miserable people. It's rarely factored into the business plan. So what we do is we welcome people in, ask their opinion, and give them a voice. You know, that employee voice is so important, as you were talking about earlier, Cathy. Um, Two ways we do that, and there are many, we have a six-month probation at the agency. And three months into that probation, we have an NPS check-in. NPS being Net Promoter Score. I'm not sure you all know what Net Promoter Score is. Scoring something on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being low, 10 being high, on how likely you would be to recommend it. And we asked the person who's just joined, how likely would you be to recommend PropellerNet? Just to get a feel of how they feel about the business. And on the flip side of that, and they know this, it's an open process, we ask other people in the business to NPS that person to stay which can feel like a massive challenge. It's not there to be done as a blackballing sorority thing. It's there to pick up any business challenges or issues that person may have so we can help them fly through their probation at six months. There's a brilliant book um, called Who by Randy Street, what a fantastic name, and um, Jeff Smart. And it talks about recruitment. And if you get recruitment wrong, it can cost 15 times that person's salary to sort it out. So if you can get recruitment right and check in at the right stages, it makes a big difference to the business and levels of engagement. Another thing we do is fresh eyes. So when people pass their probation, I sit down with them and talk about their fresh eyes on the business. Because you know, it's like if you, if you go to a new house or <clears throat> looking to, to move house, and you see all these things you want to do with the house when you first arrive, and then six months later you, kind of, you can't see them anymore, you're blinkered. 
That's what happens in business. You don't see what you need to change. So anybody new coming in, I ask, you know, what would you do? And this has been brilliant in terms of changing the way we do our website, our recruitment approach, what the habitat of our building looks like, the clients we work with. And it's great because it's given that person a voice from the off, which they can use going forward, so it's great for engagement. Say no to bastards. Sorry about the swearing. Um, has anyone got a really difficult client? OK, don't, I'm not going to ask you. Yeah, go on, put your hands up. <laughs> it would really be shy. Um, how do you feel about working with that client? And how do you think your team feel about working with that client? Because we were saying it earlier, you know, you've got to listen to people around you, because if you don't, you'll be surrounded with people with nothing to say. I aim never to put toxic client revenue in front of my team's engagement, because unreasonable, demanding clients who want the moon on a stick for free will take their toll on your team, they'll suck the life out of your strategy, they'll really hit your business, and they'll take attention away from your other more well worthwhile clients. And I always say, don't think, how can I afford to be so picky? Think, how can I afford not to? Build a bucket list business plan, it's one of my faves. I can't tell you the opportunities this has given us in terms of travel businesses, our own beer brand, property investment, uh, technology products. Um, it's made such a difference if you put your scepticism to one side, imagine the loyalty this could unleash in your team, enabling them to bring their, biz their ideas and their dreams to the business, and the commercial gains too. So this one is an engagement double whammy. And last one, I'm going to ask you to think about this one, talk in your, in your tables as well. Act like there's no exit. No matter how you're set up, what would you do tomorrow? What one thing would you change tomorrow if you couldn't leave your business? There was no exit, no prospect of sale, you couldn't retire, you couldn't leave, you're there. What's the one thing you would do differently? Have a chat about that for a minute. <laughs> Whatever you're thinking in terms of what you might change tomorrow, I'd encourage you to, to actively do it and keep thinking like that because your business, if it isn't already, could become your dream and I've seen it happen before my very eyes. So there's lots more of this in terms of the manifesto and in the book, but for now, you've been amazing. I'm Nikki Gattenby, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.